Today, we're going to talk about what interfaces are, why they're useful, and how to use them in your code with real world examples of all interface features. You can rest assured that if you understand all of the concepts in this video, you'll be well equipped to use interfaces in your own code. So what is an interface? An interface is a contract or blueprint for a class. It defines what a class does, but not how it does it. For example, here's an interface playable with one method, play. Unlike a class, the play method has no body. The interface playable just describes what a playable needs to do, have a play method, but it doesn't say how the play method should work. So while interfaces provide the contract for the capabilities, classes implement interfaces to provide the how using the implements keyword. Here we have two implementations of the playable interface, video and audio, which override the play method to specify how the playing should be done. But what's the point of the interface? Why don't we just have a video class and an audio class that both have play methods, but no interface? Well, interfaces allow us to write code that is agnostic to the implementation. This class, player, can play any playable, so we can use it to play video and audio. Here's an interface, logger, with two implementations. Logger has one method, log, that takes a string. The console logger takes that string and prints it to the console. The file logger takes the string and stores it in a file. Now other classes can say, I need a logger to log some messages, but I don't really care what sort of logger you give me, just give me one that's appropriate in the context. So let's extend the logger example so I can show you this common and powerful pattern to combine multiple implementations of an interface. Here's composite logger, which itself is an implementation of logger, so it has implements logger in it, and it overrides the log method. And what it does is it takes a list of other loggers, and in its log implementation, goes through every other logger and calls log on it. Here's composite logger in action. We create a composite logger of a console logger and a file logger. So now when the thing doer logs doing something, it prints it to the console and writes it to the file. Okay, let's look at another common use case for interfaces, integration with third party libraries. A library may define an interface for us to implement, essentially saying, if you have objects that have these capabilities, I can work with them. Say there's a library fancy optimizer, which can find the minimum of a function. It's got a really fancy optimization algorithm that's really fast and complicated, and we want to take advantage of it without having to implement the optimization algorithm ourselves. What the library does is provides the interface minimizable, which defines everything that the library needs to work. In this case, it's got one method, getValue, which returns the value of the function we want to minimize at a specific x coordinate. Now, to use the fancy optimizer, all we have to do is implement the minimizable interface. And now our minimizable function is compatible with fancy optimizer. Let's take a step back from the examples and talk about some of the other features of interfaces. Interfaces can have constants. Here, I've added a constant to the logger class called default log level with a value of info. The syntax kind of looks like default log level is a field, but don't get confused. Because we never instantiate an interface directly, the Java language implicitly provides the keywords public static final in front of string. Interface fields are implicitly public static and final, and interface methods are implicitly public and abstract. These keywords are redundant, meaning they're allowed, but almost always omitted. This is a source of confusion for many people new to interfaces. Compare these two versions of logger. They're exactly the same thing, but in the second one, I've spelled out all of the implicit keywords. If you're new to interfaces, you might find it helpful to spell out these keywords explicitly for a little bit, but eventually you'll want to drop them. Now for a long time, that was kind of it for the story of interfaces, but Java 8 introduced some powerful new features for interfaces, which brought them closer in capability to abstract classes. Nowadays, there are very few reasons to use abstract classes over interfaces, so you should probably default to using interfaces where possible. The main reason to use an abstract class instead of an interface is if you've got some state that you want to manage in a field, because like I said, interfaces don't have instances, so they don't have instance fields. Let's talk about the three big features that Java 8 introduced for interfaces, default methods, static methods, and the most powerful and my favorite functional interfaces. First, let's start with default methods. Default methods are methods with bodies in an interface, not just signatures. They're implicitly public, but not abstract because they have an implementation. Default methods can also use other methods in the interface, even though from the interface's perspective, the implementation of those methods doesn't exist yet. Here, I've expanded the logger interface to have a log error method, which delegates to the other log method, but prepends the prefix error before the error message. Default methods can be used to share common functionality between implementations and add new functionality without breaking existing implementations. 
There's nothing stopping you overriding default methods though. Here we've extended the file logger to override log error to log errors to a separate file. The second feature Java 8 added to interfaces is static methods. They're just like static methods in classes, or just like static constants really, in that they're attached to the interface directly rather than any instance. Here we've added the static method getDefaultUsername to userStore. We can use getDefaultUsername without an instance of userStore using the normal syntax for accessing static constants in methods. Okay, so here's the big one, functional interfaces. These really elevated interfaces and made them much more expressive. Recall the minimizable interface from earlier and all the syntactic cruft we had to surround our function with. We had to create a new class, implement the interface and override the method. Java 8 made this so much easier. Instead of creating a class to implement the interface, we can implement the interface directly with a Lambda expression or a method reference. This works for any interface with exactly one abstract method. You can remember this with the mnemonic SAM, single abstract method. It saves us from having to write a whole class to implement a simple interface. Here we've implemented minimizable with just a lambda expression, just the bit that we care about. So we can use the fancy optimizer without creating a class just by providing a lambda expression to the find minimum method. This obviously overlaps with the concept of lambda expressions in general, and unfortunately it's a topic too big to cover in detail in this video. But if you find an explanation of lambda expressions in general useful, drop a comment down below, and if there's enough interest, I'll create a video explaining them in detail. You can optionally annotate an interface intended to be functional with the functional interface annotation. This will ensure that the compiler checks that the interface is indeed functional, i.e. that it has a single abstract method. As I say, this is optional, but it's a good idea if you intend an interface to be functional. There are a number of built-in functional interfaces like function, consumer, and supplier, and many more esoteric ones like tolong by function, int predicate, and double unary operator. You can implement these using lambdas or method references just like your own interfaces. It's a matter of taste when to use built-in functional interfaces or define your own. Often, I find that defining your own makes your intent clearer. For instance, I prefer that the fancy optimizer defines its own interface because it makes the intent clearer than using the inbuilt function interface. There's no cost really to defining your own functional interfaces like this because it's easy to convert between the two representations with method references. Let's talk about some more advanced interface features. These were available pre-Java 8, but it didn't really make sense to talk about them before because they're a little more complicated. Unlike when extending classes, a class can implement multiple interfaces, which indicates different aspects of a class's behavior. For example, audio log implements both logger and playable. So it has to implement the log method from logger and the play method from playable. Audio log can now be used anywhere that we expected a logger or a playable. But what happens if two interfaces have default methods with the same name and we want to implement them both? Here, implementation implements both A and B, which both define default methods print name. What should happen when we call print name on implementation? Conceptually, we should have no preference between print name from A or print name from B. So in fact, the Java compiler requires you to explicitly override the default method. You can choose to use one of the implementations from the interfaces using the super keyword. There are other more specific rules too, but this is the most common case. Interfaces can extend other interfaces. Here, error logger extends logger. It adds the method log error to the existing methods from logger. So when console logger implements error logger, it has to override both log and log error. Then console logger can be used as either a logger or an error logger. This is useful when you want to add new functionality to an existing interface without breaking existing implementations where default methods are not appropriate. You can create a new interface, extend the old one, and migrate implementations as required. Interfaces can be generic, just like classes. Here, store has a generic type parameter t, which we use within the method signatures. Implementations of store can either be generic themselves, like in this case, or they can specify a fixed value for the parameter t, and I'll show an example of that later. We use generic interfaces in much the same way as generic classes. I've got a whole video on generics if you're interested in learning more, which I'll link below. Java collections are common examples of generic interfaces. List, map, and set are all very common generic interfaces, which you've probably seen before. Based on everything we've talked about so far, you can see why it's preferable to call the integer list a list of integers rather than an array list of integers, because it allows us to change the implementation of list later without changing any of the other code. Here's an example of a built-in generic interface where the implementation specifies the value of the type parameter. The comparable interface indicates that a class is capable of being compared to another type. 
we implement comparable of user in our class user, which specifies how to compare a user to another user. In this case, we compare based on their username. This allows us to use built-in methods to sort lists of users. You can see that collection sort takes a list of t extends comparable of question mark super t. And if you want me to explain all of that jargon, leave a comment down below and maybe I'll create a video about it, but it's pretty um, esoteric. So in summary, we've had a great time with interfaces. Interfaces are a contract or a blueprint for a class. They define what a class does, but not how it does it. Interfaces allow us to write code that is agnostic to the implementation, which reduces coupling and allows us to swap implementations based on context. Interfaces have a variety of expressive tools for modeling behavior, including default methods, static methods, interface inheritance, and generic interfaces. And functional interfaces enable concise implementations of simple interfaces, interfaces with single abstract methods. Thanks for watching. I really hope you got something out of this. Any questions or suggestions, please leave a comment down below. And if you got something out of this, consider liking the video or subscribing. It really helps with the channel and it ensures you won't miss an upload from me. If you want more videos like this, consider supporting me on Patreon. Creating videos like this is very time consuming and I have a full-time job that I do alongside this, but Patreon is one way of enabling me to do more of this sort of work.